Hello, and welcome to our second image review seminar. My name is Jacob Avila. I am the Vice President of Clinical Education and Training, and I am joined by Peter Weimersheimer, who is the VP of Clinical Implementation. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jacob. It's great to see you. It seems like a long time since we've done one of these, so looking forward to looking at some images and a little banter. So looking forward to a nice session. Right on. We're going to go through some really sweet cases that we've accumulated um, over the past few weeks to months. We also have some submissions for our image reviews. So if you have a great case, make sure that you share them with us. That's image review at butterflynetinc.com. But before you send us those, check out what we have first. Now let's do a couple of cases first. You okay with that, Peter? A couple of cases? Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, let's go. All right, so this patient comes in and they are acutely short of breath. Now, they don't have any medical problems, but they are a bit on the older side. So we're talking um, 60s, 70s. They have no medical history, but it turns out they've never seen a doctor before in their life. Now, I throw on this echo because that's usually the first thing that I'm doing, and I see a pretty massively dilated heart but here's the thing. When we see a massively dilated heart, I like to focus in on the different chambers. The right heart does look a bit big, right? A bit big. But I don't know. I'm not sure that this is like a chronic process. What, what are your thoughts on this echo? This like one echo, right? I mean, I'm sorry. I don't have other views. It was busy. We just got this one view, this apical four chamber view. What are your thoughts on it? My, you know, if you look at the left side, the left side also looks pretty large as do the atria. Mm -hmm. And so for this mm -hmm. patient who fortunately hasn't had any known uh, problems and hasn't seen a physician in a while. Uh, my guess is this probably would be chronic just by the fact that it's biventricular and both of the atria are pretty enlarged. Right. No, I agree. And and looking at this, is this is the left side over here. This is the right side. I mean, the right side does look big, but it almost like looks big in relation to that left heart, right? I mean, it's it's definitely bigger than 0.6 to 1 ratio. I mean, you might even argue that at times it looks like this is a bit bigger. And by the way, if you ever aren't sure which way is left and which way is right, you can always look at this little guy right here, the circle thing. This is the uh, descending aorta. Um, and that, I mean, I'm never going to say invariably, but pretty much invariably is going to be on the left side of the heart. So this is a good indicator down here if you're not really sure where the probe marker is, that this is the left heart. And I'm looking at this, Peter, and it, I'm looking at this right atrium. And for me, a lot of times I look at the atria to kind of help me decide if something's like a chronic or a acute process, right? Because this person could have something crazy like a big PE, or they could have heart failure that they now have pulmonary hypertension from that heart failure that causes right heart enlargement. I'm looking at this right atrium. It looks really big. Like a lot bigger than that left atrium. So from my perspective, this looks a bit more like it's chronic. Yeah, that's. I think that's the, the standard thought that when you have a large right atrium, that's going to be chronic and took a while to develop. Although I, I can tell you that in my clinical history, I've had some patients who came in with massive PEs who by their history and age, there was no way they would have chronic core pulmonale and they would have a big oh. RA. So I think gotcha. once the, all, the, the, the adage of always playing doctor to the bedside and, and uh, taking a look at what your, how, who your patient is, how they're presenting, and, mm -hmm. uh, and having some humility, even for the things that never happen that, that do happen. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, here's another one. Um, now this one right here is another one that I, I look at it and I say like, man, this looks pretty chronic, a very large right side of the heart over here. The thing that kind of throws me off about this is we talk, we've talked about TAPSI before. The last time uh, that we had our imagery, we talked about TAPSI. And I'll tell you, eyeballing this TAPSI over here, a tricuspid annual plane of systolic excursion, it looks pretty good, right? Like, do you think this is somebody that we see acutely, like, would you just push thrombolytics based off of this one clip showing massive right heart enlargement? Depends on how many lawyers are outside the door, but probably <laughs> not. Also, if you look yeah, up just likewise. by the, on, by the, you can see a bit of the right ventricular free wall up on top there. And mm -hmm. that also doesn't look just by eyeball to be that large. So, right. yeah, I'd be, uh, again, it's a large RA and the mm -hmm. LV is certainly much smaller than the RV in this image. But I'd be cautious about trying to get a little more information. 
Right. Now, this one right here, I'm, I'll let you know, this another huge right hard. I know that this one is a chronic process over here. I mean, this right hard is so big, I can't even like fit it into the full screen. One thing I want us to focus in on is, you see how, I mean, we can't see the RV free wall, but you see how like right here, it's a little, it seems like a little on the thick side. Just thinking about it without having any objective measure, it looks a little bit on the thick side. And then remember that any time that you have uh, hypertrophy, you have a chronic process, it creates hypertrophy. That hypertrophy is more indicative of a chronic process. So more likely to be chronic. And that's actually one of the things that we can use to figure out if something's acute or chronic. And these are the five things that I use to help me decide if something's acute versus chronic. And these are five things at the bedside. Obviously, a lot of these patients are going to get CT scans, and that's really going to you know clinch the diagnosis for us. But at the bedside, we have these five things. Peter, what's which one's your favorite out of all of these? I'll tell you what mine is after you tell me what yours is. Uh, the history button on the ultrasound, probably my favorite yeah. to start with. But yeah. No, I agree. I mean, you, you got to understand what's going on. Uh, like the thing attached to the ultrasound image is super important. Yeah. And then po probably free will hypertrophy, although ESN is pretty cool uh, coming down the pipe here. Yeah, I was super excited about ESN, yeah. actually. Like that is my favorite. It's a little bit harder to obtain, but it's still basically like a single measurement. Um, now, all of these are accessible, but I will say, and Peter, feel free to disagree with me, the 60-60 sign Ultrasound nerds like you and I love the 6060 sign, but I think that it might be a little bit, it, it's just, it takes a bunch of steps and some calculations. So for the most part, I don't really teach 6060 sign all that much. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think the 6060 sign is, is fun to do. It certainly is a more advanced because it requires measuring and getting velocities. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is, is, going to the side of a, a patient and trying to make a decision about whether what we're seeing is acute or chronic and, and the other ways of measuring and other ways of assessing for the most part work fine. So something to do if you're really into doing measuring, but otherwise the other, other techniques work really well. Let's, you know what? Let's just forget about it. We're just going to forget about the 6060 sign. If anybody wants to know about it, there's plenty of resources online uh, that you can look at. But And we might talk about it later, but for now, we're just going to focus in on RV free wall hypertrophy, McConnell sign, and early systolic notching. That's ESN. I really feel like this is like the easiest one right here. Like this is looking for RV free wall hypertrophy. Normally you do this on a sub xiphoid view. You can do it on a peristernal view as well, but I like doing it on the sub xiphoid view. You get your best sub or excuse me, subcostal view, and you freeze the image when you're in diastole, so when the chamber size is the biggest, or I try to think about it when the wall itself is going to be kind of squeezed the most. And you freeze the image, and you do a measurement of that RV free wall. You can see it right there. And I have a measurement here of 0.73 centimeters. Anything higher or larger than 0.5 centimeters is more consistent with an acute Anything bigger or larger than 0.5 centimeters is consistent with a chronic process because that's hypertrophy. So this is a good way to kind of help push you one way or the other. Peter, I, I, we're just talking about this. Like, be real with me. How often are you doing this measurement? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. You want me to go first or do you want to go first? No, you ask me. So I'll, I'll set myself up for failure and say not very often. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I like to get an apical four chamber view and slide over to the RV free wall because then I can eyeball the the wall as well. But you, I also feel like I get a better view of trabeculi, and on that, okay. when I, so when I see a thick wall and a lot of trabeculi, I'm, I get much more comfortable about this being a chronic condition or not. But I think I, mostly I'm eyeballing and not measuring. So your turn yeah. to change that Let me myth. Me, no, I mean, me too. I, I very rarely will actually measure the free wall. Um, it's just something that's available. I mean, you know, we we both, I think you more than I, like building things. And, you know, we have a bunch of tools. And, I mean, there's some tools that y you might use every single time you do anything, like a, I don't know, like a circular saw, a drill, and a hammer, right? Those are pretty common. But then you might have another tool, like you might have an, an angle measurement tool or you might have a jigsaw those tools, depending on what you do, you might not use very often, but you need them and you shouldn't get rid of them, but you don't always use them. That's kind of like what I think about this measurement. Like I don't use it all the time, but I don't not do it ever. Right. Yeah. 
It's yeah. rare, but I'll use it. And actually, one of the things that's that we always forget, or I always forget, or, or trying to remind people is, that especially in this view here, where you have that free wall that's essentially parallel in the in the image here, is you just take your eyeball and look to the side, right? So this isn't we're not building a piano. It's not significant figure. So pretty easy right. to look in, at that wall and just eyeball that. It. Yeah, it's about half a centimeter. Close enough. I'm good with that. Close enough. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Now, you talked about getting the apical four chamber view, and on the apical four chamber view is what I would probably, I mean, you know, you anybody can disagree with me, but I feel like the most commonly used thing to see if it's acute versus chronic is this right here, which you usually obtain on an apical four chamber view. Peter, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at uh, part of the apex on the right side, which seems to be bowing and deforming uh, with yeah, cystic and diastole. So that would be a McConnell sign. Yeah. So McConnell sign, we're seeing it right here, just like you mentioned. We have some RV free wall hypokinesis, hyperkinesis relative um, of the apex. And that is thought to be due to an acute process. Now, most of the time, this is for sure due to PE because I'll, most of our patients in the emergency department, at least, they come in and they have an acute right heart process. Probably the most common thing is going to be a PE, probably. But we have to talk about this. Like, does does this always mean a, a PE, Peter, or does this not always mean a PE? Well, there's a big but, and and I think the point is, especially this is really appropriate for for clinical ultrasound that you're using the ultrasound to answer specific questions. So if you took your transducer and you scanned a whole bunch of people who showed up in your emergency department just randomly and they're older patients, you'll see a lot of McConnell sign. And so again, back to one of the favorite measures of chronic versus acute is that history, if the story fits a piece, your pretest probability is high, then McConnell sign has a lot of value in steering you towards that diagnosis. But uh, all comers, it, it's pretty commonly seen for a bunch of different reasons. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and actually, there's data to support exactly what you're saying, where if you look at everybody who gets an echo in the hospital, like the McConnell sign is not very sensitive uh, for a PE. But if you take emergency department patients that had a pretest probability of a PE, it's highly sensitive, uh, at least for a submassive or a massive PE. Because remember, like, most PEs are not going to actually cause right heart enlargement. It's the submassive and the massive PEs, the ones that actually are creating strain on the heart that are going to cause right heart enlargement in the first place, and then this finding of McConnell sign. So, I mean, we're using this to rule in a big PE, not to rule out anything. Man, there's this uh, there's this course, I'm sure it's still going on, that I went to a few years ago in Dublin, and it was like a whole course just on venous thromboembolism like it was like a week of just vte stuff like there's so much nuance to this stuff that's, that's um so there's so much morbidity mortality it's so common like it's insane like that and that's why i think it's important that we understand you know the limitations i guess and along those lines this is a patient that actually came in pre-hospital with a inferior mi on the ekg so i don't know uh, a right coronary artery infarct confirmed on cath lab. Now it's not a great image because I, I did this like while I was walking with the patient as they were going up, like getting to the elevator to go up to the cath lab. And you can see here that this patient, it's kind of a janky one, but the patient does have a McConnell sign here, right? And this McConnell sign is due to an RVMI. Um, so a good example of why the McConnell sign doesn't always mean a PE. And then the other common cause, probably the most common cause overall in all patients is going to be um, like an acute worsening of core pulmonale um, will cause this McConnell sign as well. Right. So okay. uh, again, you know, I, I, said, I suppose if you had unstable patients, we were considering lytics, McConnell mm -hmm. sign would be a helpful adjunct, but you still need to look around and really confirm that you have the right diagnosis but it's certainly helpful to steer that diagnosis agreed now let's talk about our favorite one and that is early systolic notching now this one right here it's going to take a fun view so you want to get a high perishable short axis view here's the aortic valve um, we have the tricuspid valve over here and what we're looking for is we're trying to get a good view of that pulmonic valve with a pulmonary artery coming out of it right there now once you get that view what you do is you place the pulse wave doppler gate 
There's some places that talk about placing it more proximal. I've had a little more success with getting a good waveform if I put it a little more past the valves but you're looking to get an actual Doppler waveform. And that's what we have here. So here's a waveform, here's a waveform. And you see how it's almost like a fin, it's like a sharp up with a slow kind of down, just like a fin. This is not early systolic notching. Now I'm gonna show you an example from my uh, pre and apart from butterfly website core ultrasound that we have on there. And you can see here, we have a very sharp spike with a kind of gradual decline here. Whereas over here, we're seeing a notch here in the front half. So imagine you draw a line, an imaginary line in, right in the middle of that uh, waveform here, of that envelope. And if you get a notch on the early or the beginning 50% of it, that's considered early systolic notching and seems to be a highly accurate finding for an acute right heart process, specifically speaking about PEs. And there's a lot of actually cardiology literature, not a whole lot of EM literature, critical care literature about this, but a decent amount of cardiology literature that actually talks about this as a finding for acute right heart enlargement and acute right heart enlargement in the setting of an acute PE. Yeah, this is really cool. And uh, by the way, fantastic images. So I have a question for you. Uh, uh -huh. Both of us, when we're teaching at the bedside and trying to teach how to get a really nice pulmonic valve view. What's your trick of the trade to try and get that? Because it's it's a little bit of a challenge, right? It's 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 relatively easy to get the aortic valve, and then to how to really go from the aortic valve to the that right side is a little pulmonary valve is a little bit challenging. So, what do you, what's your trick? So this view sometimes there's nothing you can do to get it to work. If you're able to move your patients all the time onto their left lateral cubitus, that by far is like the easiest thing to, the easiest way to, to optimize that image. But the problem is, is that most of the patients I feel like that I'm doing this on, um, they're acutely unstable and I can't even really lay them flat. Um, because if I lay them flat, they're going to get short of breath and they're going to do bad. And so I, I can't even do that. Um, but if I can't lay them down flat, I'm, I'm honestly, most of the time when I'm doing this, I'm, they're sitting 45 degrees or upright because they're sick and they say they can't breathe it they lay down flat i'll get my best parasternal long like a, a regular parasternal long and i'll slowly track so let's say you know i have the probe like this and i'll slowly track it up till i get to this view that aortic valve view right. and then i will try to angle the transducer a little bit and twist it clockwise or counterclockwise to basically open up this view that we're seeing right out here and i can't tell you like this technique always works. I just go up, I tilt my tail a little bit, and then I'll do slight rotations to try and get exactly along the axis of the RVOT or the right ventricular outflow tract, as well as get a good view of that pulmonary artery. What do you, what about you? What what tips techniques do you same, do you same, utilize? Same thing. I I because I, yeah, I always when I talk about getting parasternals, I always talk about starting the clavicle and sliding south or towards the feet until you get that nice perfect view and then exactly the same i'll say okay now you've slid down now slide up a little bit towards that that left shoulder and and just start looking for that outflow tract so a similar technique yeah and on these like I, I i don't know what my percentage is but there's times that i try really hard and i've done you know, I don't know thousands of these things sometimes i just can't get the view correct and i move on <laughs> you know there's this is why there's a bunch of different things you can do Right. The best lesson is knowing when to stop and do something else because what you're doing is not going to work. So exactly right. Touché. Exactly right. All right. So let's move on to lately one of my favorite things to talk about, and that is cardiac arrest ultrasound. Like I have a whole like lecture, and I think you do. You do too. Like a whole lecture about you know how to use ultrasound and cardiac arrest. One of the big things is this idea that ultrasound ultrasound prolongs pulse checks, which is not true. What's prolonging the pulse check is the person holding the probe. Like the ultrasound machine does not have a mind. It's not like a sentient being that's causing the pulse checks to last longer. It's the person not realizing that 10 seconds are up. So there's a couple things. Um, I, when I'm running codes, I like to have the, whoever's keeping track of the time to actually count down the pulse checks from 10 seconds all the way down to zero. And then at two seconds, that's when we're basically getting off the chest. So for me, I basically have eight second pulse checks. And the way that I use ultrasound is like to not prolong it an extra step besides the counting is I get ready before the pulse check. So what I'll do is I will 
uh, about 30 seconds before pulse check, we'll charge the defibrillator. I will get gel on my transducer ready to go. I'll actually hit the record button before the pulse check. And then I have like a rag nearby. And so this is what I'm doing here. So it, it was basically pulse check time and or close to pulse check time. And I went ahead and started recording. That's where you have this blank kind of image right here. And then pulse check, boom, we throw the transducer on that subcostal view. Peter, what what do we do here? Stop. Do we wait? Like the CPR. <laughs> but it hasn't been 10 seconds, Peter. We have to, we must wait 10 seconds, yeah. right? That's like waiting six hours on a tile. It uh, doesn't make a difference. So one of the things yeah. that, you know, for, for people who are, are learning, you can mm -hmm. tell that first part of the clip that it was all bright is because if you have a transducer without gel on it in a phase array setting, you won't see anything. It'll just be black. So the fact you see that nice, mm -hmm. big, bright white cone means you've got gel ready to go. Yeah, and personally, yeah. Uh, waiting longer and really trying to look at this for a long period of time is not going to change your decision node in terms of how you're managing. What I actually do, very similar, I, actually, I set my machines to six seconds. So, and what that means is that nobody can stay on for more than six seconds because the images are just stop. And what's it's also important to remember is that, for instance, if you really want to look at this image for some subtle things, which I'm not sure what you would see, you pull mm -hmm. you, you pull the probe off, you wipe it down, CPR is resumed, and then you can look at the ultrasound image on the machine as CPR is in progress. So I think that, that people sometimes get maybe absorb and try and interpret what they're seeing and try and make that diagnosis during resuscitation. A reminder mm -hmm. that if you push that record button, whatever was seen during the time of the probing on the chest that was recorded is available for review. So get a nice picture if you can. If not, pull off and wait to the next time. One thing that I do often, if I'm going to try a sub I actually do a lot of apical force during resuscitation oh, as nice. well. But I'll take my yeah, transducer like during CPR, and you know there's gels south of the, where people are pushing. But I'll mess around during CPR to try and find a window. And then I'm ready when, as soon as CPR stops, my, my transducer is there. I have the window. I push the button, make my recording, and I'm off afterwards. So Brilliant. I think that to the point that it, the ultrasound is associated with uh, prolonged CPR, again, to your point, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the operator. So just remember to take the picture, get, get off the chest, and make a decision based on what you see in the image. I agree. All right, next, next pulse check. We have the same thing, blank screen to start with. And this one has no gel, for the record. There you go. Yeah, that's right. There was already gel on the patient. <laughs> so what if somebody says, I don't feel a pulse? resume compressions now that's a tricky one right it's a tricky one because we're, we're seeing motion well but i don't know do you think that's enough like what what would you do in this situation and this is all theoretical hypothetical every patient is going to be different the clinician at the bedside is the one that's going to ultimately make the, the the decision but let's have a thought experiment here what what would you do in that case I probably would would start with just keep on just normal resuscitation protocol without CPR. But this is controversial, right? So uh, there's cardiac activity. There's there's actually you can see the valve is opening up and closing relatively mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. this person is has flow and is perfusing. Is adding uh, CPR going to change perfusion? That's kind of one of the baits, right? Sometimes you see a little bit of activity and keep on going with CPR because the activity subjectively doesn't seem like enough, but that that's controversial. Um, so right. I, I would probably just go for just resuscitative efforts and stop CPR at this point. Yeah, I agree. Now, what about this guy out here? Didn't have it before. Now they have a little effusion. At least you're seeing it now. The patient that's presumably has ROSC now. Yeah. Do you, should we act on this? I mean, this is an abnormality, right? I mean, there is, and it's not insignificant, right? It's not like a sliver of an effusion. It's not huge, but it's it's an effusion. I mean, should we cons should we get ready for pericardial synthesis on this patient that now has ROSC and didn't before? Uh, I think you can remember that it's there. If you look at that image, the RV is is pretty large. It's not being compressed, and it's not so smushed. as much as I love sticking needles and things and draining stuff, I probably would. Do what you can do with a clinical ultrasound system, right? You can mm -hmm. duly noted, keep on working on your patient, and then come back a little bit of period time and ask yourself, does this look the same? Does it look different? Is this actually getting bigger? Is there something I need to do about it because of its dynamic process versus being a static bunch of fluid that exists there? Mm -hmm. 
and, Agreed. Yeah, and pericardial effusions are relatively common when there's resuscitation. So not quite sure what that mechanism is, but you see it fairly often. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And then you mentioned the apical four chamber view, and I I agree. Um, you the apical four chamber view, I like it because you can get it during resuscitation. Um, it doesn't really get in the way. The sub view, I'll be honest with you, is a little hard to get during chest compressions, even though you're away from the chest compression area, just because when they're pushing on the chest, it's like pushing the diaphragm down. So it's hard to get your hand like underneath the xiphoid if someone is basically pushing the diaphragm towards you, right? So the apical four chamber view is great. It doesn't get in the way and there's no like pressure from the chest compressions making it so you can't see, but you can also look at a parasternal view, right? Here's a parasternal view of cardiac standstill. This is a parasternal long here. And then we have this right here. This is a uh, pleural effusion right. uh, because it is posterior to this little aorta right here. Um, but you can also use it. This is cardiac standstill. If this is, you know, a, 90 year old cancer patient smoker we've done resuscitation for 20 minutes and when we see this like this is not a good prognosis uh, and this may aid in your decision um, to terminate resuscitation or to continue resuscitation I, I would never base yes or no answers fully just on the ultrasound but just like anything it's a it's a component of what you do as a clinician right and that's a, a great picture i think to your point of sub was often not being useful uh, one of the, the cool things about sonography and learning different cardiac windows is sometimes one of them works and the other one doesn't. And, you know, even, for instance, for, uh, for EFAS or trauma patients, right, the standards do the subcostal, and half mm -hmm. the time that's not going to work. So you go to the parasonal long and get a nice quick picture and just get a quick assessment of activity or a fusion or something and just get the mm -hmm. information you're asking about. So yeah, really nice picture and agreed if this is 20 minutes of downtime, uh, not a very good prognosis. All right. All right, next image is, let's say you're working with residents, you have a trauma patient that comes in, they are stable, but the resident says they don't hear breath sounds on one side and they show you this clip and they say it's a pneumothorax because it's a lung point. And a lung point is basically the border of uh, together lung and not together lung. So the border of the pneumothorax, seeing sliding on one side, absence of lung side on the other. And Peter, I'll, you know, just being objective, I see sliding over here and over here, it looks like maybe no sliding on this side. I mean, should we just throw in a chest tube? Like what, what would you do at this point? Well, number one, no emergent chest tubes if a patient is not hypotensive. That gets you in a Fair. lot of trouble. And yeah. I would uh, really take the resident and show them that on that right side, that actually is a structure. It's not a lung. So it, it does have, mm -hmm. you can see there's a little bit of a, a some A-line effect there, but it's tissue. That's mm -hmm. the heart. So um, probably not worthwhile throwing uh, a chest tube in this patient. Yeah, they, they would they would definitely get a pneumothorax. They didn't have one before. They'd get one if you put that chest tube in. So this is, uh, I call this the heart lung point. Here, we see an actual lung point. So you see here, we have good lung sliding. And then over here, we have the absence of lung sliding. So that same white line. This is a true lung point because we're seeing just basically artifact deep to it, not tissue. Whereas over here, we're seeing like a wiggly thing that's a bit of tissue in this area right there. This is a heart lung point and then this is a true lung point you can also get a lung diaphragm point but that's looks very similar but you actually see like either liver or spleen come into view and then where to be cognizant of that is if you're lower on the chest or near the nipples um you know anywhere anterior lateral um that's probably the diaphragm what you're seeing it's actually there. pretty amazing that using sonography how high the diaphragm is on people's chest and so all the times that we were putting in blind chest tubes i'm i shudder to think about how many sub diaphragmatic tubes were placed but to the point of the diaphragm yeah, lung point um one is you it's 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 sobering where the diaphragm is and number two it, it'll look like a lung point but there will be tissue or something uh to that part which is not moving which looks like a structure versus looks like the lung itself that makes sense. There's a lot of ultrasound stuff that I really enjoy. And one of the things that I really enjoy is looking for regional wall motion abnormalities. 
Now, what what do we? This is a apical four chamber view. They're the they're both the same patient. It's just this one. Uh, I'm looking uh, at a a little more yeah. of an apical five chamber view, and then I switch over to an apical long axis with ProMarker op just to kind of like see three D what's going on. This is just straight up an apical four down here. What part is not moving super well? In uh, your this opinion? is like a mini Takasubu. It's just the just the apex there is is out. So <laughs> not, not like a slight broken. That's right. Yeah, the apex is is, is definitely out. So yeah. that would be the LAD. So this is a, uh, and, and you know what really? I have to say that in my and and at in my shop, one of the things that got a street cred with the cardiologist was our ability to call up the cardiology cath lab attending and say, hey, this person has a non-diagnostic EKG, and oh by the way, there's an LAD lesion, so they need to go to the cath lab. So uh, a couple of those cases, and the cardiologist thought we were actually competent which was an amazing thing for cardiologists well i mean to in fairness to them they don't know that we can do this like they have no idea and all we need to do is just demonstrate that we have the ability to do this and then they're like and i mean by and large if we just say hey like check here's the image like look at it and they're like oh my gosh that's a great image thank you um then that's that's like really all it takes right that's all it takes now you mentioned equivocal ekg and that's another thing i was going to ask you is like how often are you using this clinically right i mean presumably most of the patients that come in with a re- an acute regional wall motion abnormality they are gonna have ekg changes right they're gonna have that STEMI on that ekg mm, right not so much uh, so sure i mean if you have a STEMI that's that's great and it's good to make that fast diagnosis and management you can activate the cath lab and then get pictures and look for wall motion abnormality but mm-hmm. uh, there's certainly a, a i don't know what percentage but a, a, a relatively large percentage of the time i've had patients come with atypical chest pain who had a non-diagnostic ekg and then by ultrasound there was clearly a wma and if you have a patient who has a history of heart disease, that becomes more challenging. And then it's a little bit of a slower process. But for someone who comes in has no documented history of having had heart disease, and they have something that's abnormal in their wall motion, that's a, that's a trip to the cath lab right away. And uh, you know, again, a nice paradigm to just remember to take that extra look because we get so we see patients with chest pain all the time. Uh, we certainly can wait for troponins, and you know, those ha- everything has error rates. So this is a pretty nice visible yes no question and if it's not if it's a yes question then don't have to worry about a lot of the other tests just call the cath lab yeah i agree and and one of the things i like to test the residents on is you know what is the first ekg finding um, in an MI and it's hyperacute T waves. And there's, there's so many different things that can cause hyperacute T waves. So this can actually help with the differential, you know, like, let's say you see hyperacute T waves. Um, the patient has a normal echo. They're just, you know, hyperdynamic. I mean, it could be a, it could be a, uh, STEMI unfolding, but also like, it could be like hyperkalemia. Right. And so that can still like kind of help you on differential. And that's another like good thing to keep in mind. The fact that, ultrasound is a component of what you do as a clinician. It's not the only thing. And it's, it's so helpful. I mean, it's not like I, I never, and I will say this, I never go a full shift without using my ultrasound in some capacity, even in those super duper busy shifts, because it is helpful, but I'm definitely not using my echo on every single patient that comes in. I'm using on the ones that it will, it matters that what I do now on slow shifts, Peter, I will scan everybody because I like it. Right. Um, but this is very beneficial in the vast majority of your patients, but so is the EKG. So is your physical examination. So is your history. And of course, um, labs. Right. But I, I, I well. ba- back to not bashing the exam, but certainly arguing that, that this is something which doesn't take a long time. And I, I how many cases can I recite that I said, Oh, what the heck I'm going to look. And I see right. a small paragard effusion for a paramyocarditis, right. or I've seen aortic dissections in asymptomatic patients mm-hmm. who have normal vital signs, and uh, and certainly some wall motion abnormalities. I think the the other EKG finding I'm always teaching our residents is that flip t, t- wave in AVL, right? Sometimes you'll see nothing else mm-hmm. and see that That's little T wave flipped yeah. over, and then put the ultrasound on on the heart, and mm-hmm. hmm, just like this one, there'd be a wall motion abnormality. Right. Yeah, no, exactly right. And I think like to clarify further, 
I, I need to do my history and at least some kind of like look at the patient to know how to use the ultrasound of patients, you know? Um, so it, it's funny, actually, I never actually built the, the full slide deck, but I had a lecture that I'm working on that is called the physical examination is a lie. So I don't want anybody to misunderstand me to say like we, the physical exam is needs to like, it's perfect and it's accurate. It's not what I mean to say at all. I mean to say that it just like everything else, there are tools that you use at certain times and tools that you right. don't use certain times, right? Like I'm not going to use a handheld drill, like a handheld uh, a screwdriver. I'm not using a handheld screwdriver Unless have, when I have a drill, right? Um, handheld to screwdriver. To the point of a really slow shift, you know, like you, maybe maybe you have a you have a nice slow day and you want to get into the just the zen of turning a screwdriver. But similar, right? If I have a slow sh if I have a slow shift, I do a lot <laughs> right. of scanning. I practice, practice, practice. But when it's busy, yeah. it's right. it's trying to help right. me answer a question. So here is another one. This is a completely different patient. Can you help me identify where the regional wall motion abnormality is? And and just to be clear, what we're looking at is not necessarily movement. We're looking for contraction of the wall. So is it getting fatter and skinnier? Right. Fatter and, and, skinnier? and for wall motion abnormalities, I like to look for the part that just seems like it's not contracting. So this one, the lateral wall, the apex, all seem like they have reasonable squeeze. But just mm -hmm. there by the septum, towards the annulus is pretty stiff. So I, I would guess that to me, that's, that's RCA it. distribution. This is, this person's having a right sided infarct. That's my guess. That's what it was. Your guess is correct. Now here's one kind of for fun. I don't say for fun. I mean, it's not uh, fun at all, but this is a patient that had a pretty bad coronary artery disease. It had uh, 30, 40 uh, previous uh, percutaneous procedures done and you can see here that it's just this horrible everywhere regional wall motion abnormality like there's a little bit of movement here like a little bit in the septum the lateral wall there's movement but there's really not any contraction there's nothing here apex is not moving very well um so a lot of disease here but what I wanted to show specifically are the different modes that you can use. This is uh, just the generic cardiac setting. Here's cardiac deep and here's cardiac coherence. And one thing that I've realized is I really like cardiac coherence specifically for regional wall motion abnormalities. I feel like I can see that wall motion really well with utilizing this specific mode. Um, Peter, do you have like a favorite that you go to with no, uh, regional agree. wall motion I like, stuff? I, I, I really like the coherence. Just for basic? I like that contrasty look when I'm looking at walls and valves. And one thing that's actually interesting for me on this image, this is this is like essentially a quivergram, right? Uh, where you look at that mitral valve flapping, mm -hmm. and I can see just a tiny bit of that aortic yeah. valve looks really calcified. And so I think a lesson we you know people use EPSS for instance to assess ventricle dysfunction, and clearly you don't need to use EPSS to know this ventricle isn't working. But anytime uh, you're seeing a, right. a mitral valve that doesn't hit the septum and you see that type of flapping or oscillation, think aortic insufficiency. And this is a perfect time to put some color on and sure. just see what kind of a jet is coming back through the aortic valve. Because that's something that's easy to pick up, even on a parasternal view, just by recognizing that flap of the mitral valve. So uh, just an indication to just look with a little bit of color and see what kind of a jet is coming back in the direction of the ventricle. Brilliant. Peter, what I want to do next is I want to actually walk through a couple of cases using some images just to kind of think about how we can utilize the information that we get clinically. So let's start off with our first case. Now, our first case is going to be a male nursing home resident, and they are newly altered and newly having an O2 requirement. It's not like a huge oxygen requirement, but it's they didn't have it before, and now they're on about four liters to maintain their oxygen saturation in the low 90s, which is fine, right? We're, we're aiming for 88 to 92 percent. Now let's let's pretend COVID negative, all right? Like not not COVID, all right? Now what I like to do is actually one of my favorite things is lung ultrasound. So we throw the lung ultrasound on there, and we identify this. Now this is the same lesion on the left side. Uh, it is kind of zoomed out so you can see where it's at. It's right above uh, the diaphragm there. It's this white line over here. And then on the right side is basically a zoomed in version of it. Yeah. Peter, what is our diagnosis here? I would make a wager that this person is altered with a hypoxic requirement from a pneumonia. That's a nice picture, Jacob, but pretty Thanks. socked, yeah, so this socked is... in lung. 
Yeah, so here we have a, a, a consolidation here. Um, this is diaphragm here, so we have a basilar one. Here's a zoomed in view. Yeah, we, we got a pneumonia for sure. Now, they got two liters pre-hospital, right? Ooh. And they're still hypotensive. It's a busy ER shift, so you tack on a third liter. You give the appropriate antibiotics because you've diagnosed this pneumonia, but unfortunately, the patient remains hypotensive. Now, in this scenario, Peter, would you, I mean, we're, we're basically, we're on our third leader, maybe our fourth leader. What would you do next? Or at least give- and, and it could be different from what I do, but what would you do? Five or six liters more because if you're not going to- No, this, I, I can tell you, uh, the, given the controversy of, of fluids and that 50% of patients mm -hmm. who are septic don't respond to fluids at all, I'd be really nervous. And I would want to take a look at some markers by ultrasound to see whether uh, the patient may be continually fluid tolerant or not. But, but I definitely want to take a look. Brilliant. And I love that you said fluid tolerant because there's this thing called fluid responsiveness, which I love. And fluid responsiveness is if you give the patient fluids, will their cardiac output increase? That's basically fluid responsiveness. And that's actually something that can be a little tricky. And we're going to talk about how we can actually use ultrasound and the butterfly transducer specifically to look for those things. But we can also assess for volume tolerance. And what volume tolerance is, is if we give the patient fluids, are we going to harm them? Can they tolerate some extra fluids? And what I usually do is I start off by looking at the anterior lung fields first, then I do the IVC, then I do the echo. I don't know, you may do a different order, Peter. But let's say you do all those three in whatever order, and you see these three findings. We have a flat IVC, we have a bunch of A-lines in the chest, and then we have a hyperdynamic heart. What does that mean exactly? Uh, well, it, it means that in the current amount of fluid that was given, this person probably would tolerate more if that was a clinical decision, um, right? And, and I can tell you that I, I, I'm pretty aggressive about looking low in the lung. I, I'm convinced that because mm. water is gravitational, that anterior is going to be a, a later finding than down towards the diaphragm. But in this case, of course, you have someone who has some pneumonia by the diaphragm, makes that a little harder. So I'll, I'll try and do be a little more gravity dependent where I look. But in, in any event, the same same paradigm, just get a quick measure of a few things that are, you know, surrogate markers for whether you can give some more fluid or not. But this is someone I probably would try a little more. I love it. No, it's great. I, I totally agree with you. So we give a little more fluids. And when I have somebody that I'm already putting like four liters of fluid in and they're like borderline or still actually hypotensive, for the most part, I'm usually just, I go ahead and start a little touch of norepi yeah. because there's been studies that show that if their, their diastolic pressure is low for like any little bit of time, it actually can increase their likelihood of death. And the longer that they are hypotensive, the, the higher likelihood they have of death. So I try to make them not hypotensive as fast as possible. Um, fluids are a good place to start, but once I'm a few liters in, I usually start norepi um because that's you know that's the most common presser that you start right most of the time norepi is going to be the, the right first answer so say you do that but the patient is still hypotensive now you've already let's say at this point you're four liters in and you're like should i do five liters or should i s increase my norepi maybe add a second presser now let's redo those three views ivc lung and heart and now we're seeing this. What's your interpretation of this, Peter? What do you think? Uh, I guess violated the rule of not giving one drop of fluid too much. Yeah, I we think that's. Too much. I, I think that's what you know. To the the discussion about fluid tolerance and fluid responsiveness, one of the mm -hmm. things that unfortunately we're, we're not that good at is understanding that there's an element of time, right? So if mm -hmm. that person had a couple liters en route and then had another liter. And we measured at that time, it hasn't really had time to distribute, potentially. And so really good point about, again, clinical ultrasound, keep on checking, keep on measuring, keep on looking, because things are dynamic. And, and it, mm -hmm. I, what is a study that where there's over 50% of patients in the ICU who've been resuscitated are considered volume overloaded by the time they get upstairs, right? Yeah. Because yeah. we do a snapshot in time, and even to fluid responsiveness right so you can demonstrate that the cardiac output increases 
question is, what does that mean 20 minutes down the, down the line? Because that is, mm -hmm. can be transient or that could be a harbinger of, of too much uh, resuscitation. So I, I would certainly yeah. back off on fluids, set the, set the fluids and give more pressors if I needed pressure support. Perfect. And so you did that. The patient was admitted. And a week later, they were discharged. Boom. Perfectly healthy. Good job, Peter. You did it. Whew. All right. Let's do our next case. Our next case is we have a morbidly obese transfer from an assisted living facility. They have a diagnosis of sepsis due to cellulitis. They have a big old, like, it's their arm is nasty. There's no DVT. Their arm is nasty. They have a big old abscess in the deltoid. Um horrible you got you're gonna have to do stuff right you are trying to get blood pressure readings but unfortunately the patient is a dialysis patient um they just started dialysis and they have a, 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 i would say a subacute dialysis uh, fistula on the left upper extremity and you're having some issues with getting good blood pressure readings in the legs because the patient's so obese and you can't really you know they're awake they're talking to you right so you know they have a pulse but you can't feel one on your physical, like you, because you, you got to put an R line around. You can't feel one in the femoral. You can't feel one in the radial. Uh, what what would you do at this point, Peter? Would you just ignore it and just like look for cap refill, or or would you still try to put that R line in? Uh, I'm I'm old school. If I can't, I put an R line in. I put R lines in pretty quickly, especially someone who's yeah. who is that old school. I think so. I I put art lines in almost everybody that I can. In fact, I didn't mention it before, but arresting patients, if I have extra people in the room, like I have a resident in the right. room, sure. I'll tell them to put in a femoral art line because then pulse checks don't matter because you can tell if they have a perfusing pressure or not. I guess I, I feel like uh, it went from we put art lines, we did a lot of stuff all the time, and then there was this, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, this change in affect where it had to be more of a need and I think, you know, I think the, to the, the common theme here is that as much as we like to, it's important to focus on exam and history, um, you just said that the information, especially for someone who is septic and obese and hard to get measurements, just that, that's the way to get an accurate measurement. Just go ahead and do it. So, yes, I would put it in. Probably would do ephemeral. I initially just put a fem line in. Me too. Me too. So here is a femoral art line being placed. You can see there's a, a decent amount of tissue between the uh, skin and the femoral mm -hmm. artery. And we're using biplane here, actually. And I like the biplane here because we can actually see the common femoral and the superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. And uh, we're seeing the long axis here and the short axis up here. The reason I like the biplane, especially for these arteries, uh, for these um, arterial cannulations is... You can see, make sure that you're in the center, which here is the catheter, the needle here, and here is the artery. So we can see we're in the center, and this tells us if our angle is good so that we don't accidentally poke through that back wall. Yep. And so here you can see uh, beginning approach here. I'll fast forward just a tad bit. Right there, yep. we're actually Punch able right to see in. that needle go in, and we're able to, to make sure that we're not poking through that back wall right there. I'm flattening it and trying to advance it a little bit further to make sure I don't go through that back wall. And important here um, is to understand that sometimes you're going to have to move the transducer, either rock it back towards the needle or move it forward to actually follow it because you can't change this line, which that's how the short axis is kind of created. It's based off of this line. You can't move this. You don't have like three hands to move this. So what right. I'll do is I'll put it there. And once I see it in the short axis, I'll see it pop up up here. I actually will move the transducer away from the needle so that I can basically continue to follow the needle tip to make sure I'm in the center of that lumen. Right. I mean, that, that line is wonderful if you have, if you have a hand to do it, but it, it is essentially mm -hmm. the same as sliding the transducer in one direction or the other in the longitudinal axis. The one thing I actually love about this as well, I think uh, my experience when I'm teaching at the access around the femoral vessels, just mm -hmm. to your point, like you don't want to be in the superior Vessel, you want to be higher, and, and and there's a tendency mm -hmm. to slide off the inguinal ligament and, and head distally on the leg, and so that that biplane view allows that that visualization of the bifurcation, so you can make sure you're above it. Right. So it's a, it's a really nice nice handy tool to just reinforce position of the transducer for that access. So really really nice nice images. All right, so you get the art line. It shows what you suspected hypotension, and the patient has gotten a liter. 
But remember, they're on dialysis. They haven't had dialysis recently, and you go ahead and do your heart, your lung, your IVC, and this is what you see. You see a bunch of beelines. You see a full, thick IVC, and then you see a heart that is you know, not beating super well. This patient, even though they're hypotensive, even though they haven't gotten a lot of fluids, with all of the information, including heart, lung, IVC, ultrasound, Fluids aren't going to help the hypotension here. The patient needs pressors and probably needs dialysis emergently as well uh, because they're probably, oddly enough, hypotensive and fluid overloaded. Yeah, that's, you know, again, a really good reminder that, that all patients that are sick and hypotensive don't need fluid. And just by definition, if you have a dialysis patient coming in, since there's no place for the water to go, just because they're sick, that water is still. And and, and to your point, mm. uh, a lot of these patients will have dysfunctional RVs, and that isn't helping the picture if the RV is, is overloaded from volume. So absolutely would start some pressors point. and probably arrange some way of, of pulling fluid off emergently. Yeah, I agree. Now, those past two cases, we've been talking about the concept of fluid tolerance. Now what I want to do is talk about the gold medal. So I, I consider fluid tolerance like a silver medal. This fluid responsiveness is, or volume responsiveness is what I think is the gold medal. There are a lot of different ways that you can assess it. Um, there are non-ultrasound methods, which are usually considered the gold standard. If you have a radio art line or a femoral all line, you can actually use that. There's actually software they can put on the devices to actually figure out if they're volume responsive. There's a bunch of differences with if they're uh, mechanically ventilated versus not. There's There are a lot of caveats. So we're not going to go into like everything fluid responsiveness, but let's talk about how we can use our butterfly to do it. I think, and I don't know what your experience is, but for me, Peter, the most easy way to do this is by actually looking at the carotid artery and looking at the carotid peak velocity variation with respiration. So you basically look at um, a few respiratory cycles of that uh, carotid artery, that common carotid artery. You have you observe a couple of respiratory cycles and you just uh, calculate the peak velocity and then you calculate the lowest peak velocity. So you're going to have all these spikes you measure the top one and then the bottom one of those systolic spikes. And you measure the difference in that. And that percent difference is actually how you can tell if somebody's volume responsive or not. Are you using these values or this calculation frequently, Peter? Uh, not that often. Be I'll, honest with me. Be honest. Not that often. But but it, it's yeah. uh, to your point, this is an easy vessel to measure. I think everyone has a carotid. And I, I could to the point that when I was doing this and I wanted to have reproducibility, I would take a Sharpie. I'd find where I put the transducer in the carotid and I would just make a little rec wow. rectangle on the skin so I could always come back and do the same point uh, for reproducibility. Mm -hmm. But, you, you know, it, it's an easy access and it, it, it probably needs a little more validation, but it's a, a pretty cool concept to, to get that measurement. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now, one of the issues that we have is the issue with the angle Correct. of incination, so you see the angle, the Doppler angle, um, if it is higher than 60 degrees, it can become like horribly inaccurate. Uh, so that's one of the problems with using this. And one of the ways around it that has been studied a little more recently is something called corrected flow time or right. the carotid corrected flow time. And the way that you calculate this basically is you identify the time in systole. So that is by the initial spike of that systole spike. And then you look for that dichrotic notch, uh, which we can actually see right here, or well, this one right here. And you measure that distance plus the overall distance between the different peaks of systole. And you plug it into Bazet's formula, which is going to be the time in systole. That's that first value beginning of systole dichrotic notch over the square root of the entire cardiac cycle. And you get that number and you can figure out what the corrected flow time is. And you can actually use that number to see if your patient is volume responsive or not. Though it's just, it's just another method that you can use or a lot of methods. What, what do you think about this? One? You, you know, I, I've never used this. I like that this eliminates a little bit of that variability from the peak flow velocity, because I guess to your point, no matter how hard you try, like I would take my little Sharpie rectangle and I try and have everything the same, but I wasn't sure how consistent I, I, my measurements were compared to 
what I was trying to interpret in terms of volume response upon the patient I was taking care of. So this is pretty cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to trying it. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's cool because the Doppler angle doesn't matter. Right. Like you can be completely wrong. You can have a Doppler angle of like 87 degrees um, and it actually showed almost completely perpendicular where you get no signal. And as long as you can get a spike and identify that dichrotic notch and identify spikes in Sicily, you can technically get this number. Um, but if you look at the number here, I mean, the numbers are basically like milliseconds. Correct. Tiny. So if you're a little off, like a complete like change your measurement. So that's actually kind of like, it's kind of tough, but it's something that some people believe in and some people utilize. And it's something that if you want to, you can use. Besides, I was going to say, just, just so I can be, you know, teaching at the bedside and just drop Bazette's formula. I think that's just the name. <laughs> that'll have street, yeah, that'll exactly. have street cred for me. Well, oddly enough, um, I obviously am super nerdy about this stuff. There's like a, there's like 10 different ways you can calculate sure. corrected flow time, but this Bazette's formula, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, is the one that is seems to be the most commonly used. So that's the one that we use. So we talked about carotid artery. You can also do the same measurements as far as the peak velocity variation and even the corrected flow time in the femoral artery. And you can also do this in the brachial artery as well. So you can definitely do that. And then the other one that I have used actually before is this, the LVOT peak velocity variation. So you get your you get your apical four chamber view, move it to an apical five, so you get that LVOT, put your pulse wave cursor just on the LVOT side of that aortic valve, and you basically do the exact same calculation. You look for the peak, the top, and then the lowest peak, and you measure the difference between the two. The number, there's actually, it's also confusing. You know how I was saying there's a lot of different corrected flow time formulas. You can also, there's a bunch of different percent uh, change formulas that you can use. There's like three, but what I usually use is the biggest number over the smallest number divided by the biggest number times a hundred. That's the one that I usually use, but there's a bunch of different ones. Um, and you can get basically the same data from this view right here. And this is the one that honestly I'm the most familiar with. Yeah. This is one, probably the one I use the most as well. So this next one that I want to talk about, and these are all methods of volume responsiveness or assessing for volume responsiveness is actually looking at the IG. Now, this was like different for me when I was like researching the information for this talk and then for the Butterfly Academy module that uh, we're currently uh, hopefully going to complete pretty soon. There's actually a decent amount of data that looks at the percent change of the internal jugular vein for markers of volume responsiveness. Obviously, just like with anything and this, you know, we're not going to go into this, but when someone is mechanically ventilated, not breathing over the vent with a slightly higher tidal volume, these are the patients that actually they're most more accurate with these measures. So with these patients right here, what you do is you place a transducer uh, just lateral to the cricoid cartilage or two centimeters from the clavicle if you can't identify the cricoid cartilage. And this was weird too. You actually use M mode through a few respiratory cycles to actually tell what the percent collapses. And M mode volume responsiveness it makes me very uncomfortable because we talk about how you can't use M mode to look for the percent collapse of the I, uh, IVC, right? But here's the thing: the jugular really doesn't move up and down as much as the I, uh, IVC does. So you can actually use this in M mode, and you can see here on the left side. We have a patient that has very minimal percent change. And then over here, we have a patient that has a lot of percent change here. Um, so this one, more volume responsive. This one, less volume responsive. Yeah, a really important point that compared to the IVC, there's not a lot of real estate in the neck for anything to move around, which is, right. you know, un unfortunately, in the abdomen, that becomes a little bit, little bit of a different problem in terms of doing IVC measurements. Yeah, agreed. Now, one thing that uh, we didn't talk about is how exactly to measure the percent collapse of the IVC. And that's something that actually, especially in intubated patients, that's actually something that has decent data. I know it's probably a little controversial because I remember learning that you can never use the IVC for volume, volume responsiveness, but it actually, the data is pretty good. And what you do basically is you have the patient go through a couple respiratory cycles, freeze it, and you'll measure the diameter at a set location, anywhere between two and three centimeters from the ready trail IBC junction, um, and you measure the percent collapse there. So that's another method, another method that you can actually use in the evaluation of your patients that are hypotensive that you're trying to figure out if you should give more fluids or not give more fluids to. 
Now, one other thing that we should discuss is there's actually a way that we can see how congested patients are, like basically how much excess fluid that they have by using the VEXA score. Now, VEXA stands for Venous Excess Ultrasound, and it's pretty sweet. It's simple. It's made by a bunch of super smart people. And uh, there's a lot of FOMED resources online. Uh, this is one that I frequently look at, POCUS 101. There's also Thinking Critical Care, which actually one of the uh, authors basically of Vexus um, has this website where they talks about it here. And you can see that the first step is actually going to be to look at, which I like this because it's like, it's almost like a, a little algorithm here. The first step is you figure out if the IVC is plump or not. The IVC isn't plump. They don't have any venous congestion. Move on, right? And this is not something that you do one time and then you stop. This is something that um, you do continually as you continue to reassess your patient. The second step is going to be looking at your hepatic vein Doppler, and you're going to be looking for specific waveforms with that. Third step is you look at your portal vein Doppler. And your third step, which to me is the trickiest one, is you look at the renal vein Doppler. And with those three things, you can actually plug it into a calculator to figure out exactly what your score is. So we have grade zero, no congestion, then we have grade one, grade two, and grade three, and we can uh, diagnose our patients with mild, moderate, and severe congestion. We very recently have completed our preliminary work on having our pulse wave Doppler function work on the abdominal setting to actually be able to do Vexus, which we're very, very happy about. We obviously are going to create a whole set of educational material around Vexus, but we just wanted to show you and let you know that this is definitely something. Now, this isn't volume responsiveness. This is to see how much venous congestion your patient has. And we can definitely be doing this at the bedside with our butterfly transducer. Yeah, Vexus is fantastic. And what's great about Vexus is Probably the IV, well, I, I guess the renal imaging sometimes is a little challenging, but I, mm -hmm. I think relative to even people struggling with their IVC, it, it's imaging in structures that are really readily available to see, uh, and you, it's not difficult to get those, those measurements. And so I think about struggling with something like a VTI or a five-chamber view or even on the carotid try, when I was, was just trying to get my Doppler gate correct. Um, this is something right. which is pretty straightforward, uh, rel relatively easy access. And I was doing it with the cardiac preset until recently, and now we have the abdominal preset. Right. So that's awesome. Which I'm very excited yeah, about. Yeah, really excited. Agreed. It's so awesome. Yeah. It's so awesome. I'm so excited. Well, that's what we have this week. Really appreciate everybody stopping by. We are working on making this a bit more of a regular cadence, so stand by for our third image review session. We would love feedback from you. Please check out the survey, and if you have any clips that you wanna to submit to us or have any thoughts uh, or comments on the clips that we use today, please send us an email at imagereview at butterflynetinc.com. Peter, it was so great to see you and hopefully we'll be able to hang out in person soon because you know we live on opposite sides of the, the country. I'm in San Diego, Sorry. you're up in Vermont, and every once in a while we get lucky and we end up in the same place and I, I can't wait to see you in person one of these days. Yeah, that, yeah I can't wait. And you know, short of that, it's fantastic hanging out with you and yeah, these are this is really fun. And to everyone who is listening, uh, send us your ideas, your thoughts, things that you want to see and images that you have that we can review. With. But this is really designed to be a, a collaborative effort. So uh, thanks for listening and thanks for joining us.